this morning. Uh, I certainly got chicken skin during the uh, I Give Myself Away song. And uh, whether you call them uh, chicken, or goose, ducks, whatever skin uh, you, you got going. Amen. Let's, uh, let's pray and continue. And at the end of our lesson today, we, we will participate in our communion uh, this morning. Uh, Lord, it's great to be able to center our hearts and our minds and, and come in to be able to sing. Thank you for the ability to pause, to just clear our minds and our hearts, and to worship you, to acknowledge who you are. And you speak to us in different ways and in individual ways. Uh, we're thankful, God, that you can minister to each and every one of us. Take our lives as we give our life to you. Take our lives and use it. Use it now and use it in the future. Help all of us, God, to be able to surrender our lives to you. And even what Art talked about earlier, we can't, we didn't bring anything into the world and we certainly can't take anything away from it. And we are here today, we're gone tomorrow. And the, the short time that we have in our lives to be able to cross paths, we want to be able to just listen to your voice and be empowered by you to be able to handle life successfully and victoriously. And that's what church is all about, to be encouraged. Not only to give encouragement, to, to be mutually encouraged as well. Uh, Father, thank you that we can focus on you and focus on Christ and learn to walk with him more effectively. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I wanted to just say a few things here in the beginning of the, the, the lessons and the scriptures, uh, uh, and then we'll, we'll dive into our, our passage today and our theme. But uh, a couple weeks ago, about a week and a half ago, our four staff couples here in the church, we got a chance to go to our annual leaders retreat. We're part of what's called the Pacific Southwest Region of Churches, and I wanted to show these churches up here. Uh, there's close to 20 different congregations in the Pacific Southwest. Uh, Guam and Saipan are certainly the farthest west of our churches, so to speak. But we also have a connection with the, the, the work in the Philippines and what's going on there. There's over 30 congregations in the nation of the Philippines. And uh, so we, 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 we help there. Uh, uh, Myanmar is connection uh, through the relationship with uh, the church here, as well as the Vienna's, have been uh, uh, partners with the, the leadership there in Myanmar. Uh, but it's encouraging to know in the Pacific Southwest, there's over 30 families of churches like this all over the world that are connected and organized in partnerships and cooperation. And so the Oahu Church of Christ and the churches here in Hawaii are part of the Pacific Southwest. I don't expect you to memorize all these churches. But just be reassured, we're part of a bigger group, a, a church family. Uh, we're not necessarily on a spiritual island, so to speak. Um, but thankful that we can go to these conferences to get re-energized, to learn best practices, to share ideas, to share conviction amongst each other, uh, to be spurred on uh, amongst our peers. And so it was encouraging for like the Thomas Shiro's to get with other campus uh, leaders in the Pacific Southwest. Nick and Shelley to get with youth and family uh, leaders, uh, for the Vienna's to connect with old relationships and us too. Uh, they put Son and I in the empty nester category, which was a little uh, different, you know, for, for us. Uh, also, part of our organization worldwide is, uh, you know, we're not led by one human being. We're led by, first of all, Jesus Christ. But we're, we're at a stage in our church development and maturity that we're, we're learning how to cooperate with each other. We're learning how to be connected and, and unified. And I appreciate what God has done to uh, help us to grow in our ability to connect and to be unified uh, amongst each other. Uh, all our churches, uh, family of churches all over the world, the 30 plus families of churches have uh, representatives to help just be a voice and a, 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 an avenue of connection and unity amongst all our churches. I wanted to just show you a picture of what's called the delegates. And these are the, the current delegates that we have in our Pacific Southwest uh, uh, family of churches. Uh, Steve Marici, top left, he's a, a region leader there, evangelist in the LA church. Greg Moretzky holding his granddaughter. Uh, he is an evangelist and a teacher in the Antelope Valley uh, Church. Uh, Jeho. Uh, Park has done uh, 
you know, lots of work in, in Korea and in Asia, and he uh, is an elder evangelist down in the Orange County uh, Church. Steve Hiddleston there is an evangelist in the Phoenix Church. The top right, uh, Pedro Garcia and his wife, Laura. Uh, Pedro uh, served as a geographic sector leader back in uh, you know, the 90s and the early 2000s, did lots of work in, in Central and South America. Uh, there's Sana and myself down in the bottom left. Uh, I serve as a current delegate right now. Uh, Mike Upton next to me, he's an elder in Los Angeles. Uh, then we have Raphael uh, Lua, who's another evangelist in Los Angeles. Uh, and his wife, who uh, actually just got uh, nominated as a woman to serve on the delegates uh, committee as well because we're really trying to build diversity in our leadership and this is what all the churches around the world are trying to do to be able to uh, handle all these types of things so Griselda was voted by the women uh, of the church leaders uh, in uh, the Pacific Southwest then we've got Steve and Carrie Lounsbury who uh, is an evangelist in Los Angeles and then we also all, all the leadership families are charged to to uh, elect a next generation leader because we've got to learn to have succession. We've got to learn to pass things off. Uh, the next generation has a lot of conviction, a lot of dreams, and we need to listen to them. We need to uh, learn what God is saying. So Amir Burton, uh, he has uh, just got uh, nominated to serve on the delegates committee. He is uh, a youth and family uh, minister as well as works on campus, and he's in the Antelope Valley uh, Church there. I just wanted to show you some, some pictures and some names to just give you an update of... of, of what we're a part of. And if you want to find out more information, you can go to icocco-op.something. It's org, net, you can figure it out. icocco-op-something. Okay? And you can find out more information about how our worldwide family is organized. And, you know, delegates and service teams and here, here's the bottom line, guys. God is our leader, and we're doing our best to figure out how to be united and connected amongst our brothers and sisters all over the world. And, you know, Orlando's coming up in 2020, and so I know that many of you have signed up. I, I, don't, remember, I don't know how many have signed up from Hawaii yet. I think the last count was close to 80 disciples uh, are, are, are registered to go to Orlando in the summer of 2020. So that that is something... I want to really put on your radar uh, to, to plan uh, uh, to be a part of because, you know, there's probably going to be close to 20,000 disciples from all around the world, from all these families of churches, uh, to be able to worship God, tons of classes, tons of fellowship. You can't, you can't recreate these events. Uh, you can't, you know, it's, it's very different looking at, on it through a video screen rather than being there in person. And so uh, make sure... Uh, you're aware of that uh, event that's coming up. Amen, brothers and sisters? All right. Let's, uh, let's, uh, let's transition here and get into our, our lesson uh, this morning. You know, we've been talking about something that's uh, been very important. If we're going to be successful, and I do want to say, first of all, it's great, it's great to have Mike Ostrom back with us and how it's you know this is all part of the family of God all over the world and the churches all over the world so I'm great grateful Mike that uh, back together with the Oahu Church to build a partner to make the Oahu Church shine for the Lord so thanks for being here uh, great to see uh, you know Tad Wakefield I need Tad from the Cal days back in the 90s and uh, he just walked up earlier today found us online his family's on vacation out here and I didn't even need to know who it was. I just heard his voice, and it was one. Oh yeah, Tad Wakefield's here, and it's been it's been a long time since we've seen each other. Uh, sisters from L.A. visiting, uh, you know, uh, with us today. But again, this just emphasizes the fact, guys. What we got church family all over the world, and and you can vacation, you can travel all over, and you'll be able to find disciples of Christ worshiping the Lord. Something that we started talking about last week, because if we're going to be able to do the mission of God victoriously and successfully in our lives, we need to be able to walk with God, to walk with God powerfully. And I've been reflecting, honestly, personally, about my own walk with God. As I mentioned last week, 
starting my 34th year as a disciple, I've had to reflect, how am I doing? How am I doing with the Lord? Where are things at for me? How can I get challenged even more to walk with God uh, closely and more powerfully in my lives? But I, I asked all of you last week, if you were here this last week, I asked you, what one thing will you do to improve your relationship with God? So what one thing will you do? How did you do this last week? What did you change? What did you implement? Was it an attitude change? Was it a, a repentance of sin? Whatever it might have been, I, I, hope, I hope you did something to improve your relationship with God. Maybe it was the same thing because you've been consistent. Maybe your relationship with God is going super well and your decision was, I just need to keep doing what I'm doing and be consistent. That's a victory in itself. But... What is God doing to make sure that you are improving and walking closely with him? You know, last Wednesday in our Ohana group, we got to share a little bit about, uh, you know, the, uh, the lesson. And one thing that I, I shared was uh, just reading in Revelation chapter 2 how uh, Jesus was addressing the church in Ephesus. And they were hardworking, they were persevering, they didn't tolerate wickedness. But one thing Jesus had against them was that they lost their first love. And, and then Jesus tells them what they can do. They got to remember, they got to repent, they got to redo, they got to redo the things they did at first. And that spurred me on this week because it's like, I can't, I can't go back to my early days. I can't go back in time, but I can remember my passion. I can remember my attitude towards God. I can remember my desire just to walk with God. Those are the things that I can hold on to as I move forward in my life. But for us to be able to remember our first love, when you fell in love with God, when that passion was there, when you got that spark joy about God, and you weren't throwing him away, but you were actually going towards him, we've got to be able to follow God with our first love. You know, I, also this week, what I did was I spent time, as, uh, as, as you know, just in terms of evaluating myself and I mentioned a little bit about things in, in my feedback that I received from brothers and sisters on the things that I need to grow in. And I appreciate those things, and I will absolutely go after the things that I'm weaker in. But I did something different today. I actually revisited what are my strengths? What, what are my strengths? I needed just a little bit of affirmation personally about, okay, how has God built me? Who am I? And what does God want me to be able to do? in my life. I certainly can boast about my weaknesses, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7 through 10. But I just wanted to be able to focus on, on strengths this last week. So uh, I came across a very helpful chart. I wanted to show it to you because I want to make it a teaching point for all of us and for myself. But uh, I think this is super helpful because uh, this, can, this can show us, and those especially for you that are visual, this will help as well. But things that I wanted to, to mention here, like on the, the foundation, there we God has given us strengths. And I'm not talking about talents. I'm not uh, gifts. I'm talking about like character strengths that's in you. And in life, uh, you can start to develop as a child and you can start developing different skills to help with your strengths. For example, let's say a child grows up and he's, he's very creative. He likes working with blocks and you just can't get away from building things. And so uh, if his parents are wise, then they may encourage him to be involved in, in building of things and creativity that way and building those kinds of skills. But then what happens is, you know, in our traditional schooling, we start learning more skills, but a lot of, uh, a lot of the, the attitude of schooling, and even a lot of parents too, is that, hey, we need to learn a lot of skills. We need to be really well balanced. We need to be diverse in a lot of things. You gotta do everything well. Uh, and, and, and so you might be learning skills that are built on your fundamental character strengths, or you may not be. Then you might grow up, you know, maybe, maybe your parents wanted you to be a doctor, but you don't wanna be a doctor. Or maybe they wanted you to be a, a lawyer and you like hate law, uh, but you apply to all the law schools because you wanted to please them, but you, you just feel something's out of place. Something's not really in my sweet spot. The way that I'm growing, the way that I'm developing. And you might 
get into school, and then you might get into your career, and to survive on your job, you have to learn some skills that are outside of your strength. And they're not building on that. Let's say this, this creative little boy grows up, and, and he's, he's, he's put into sports, or he's put into math, and he does not do well in those things. I remember my freshman year in college, uh, completing uh, calculus, that freshman class, and I remember the, the last quarter of, of calculus, and I remember saying to myself, this is the last math class I will ever take. I was looking forward to just ending. I knew, I didn't need to go through a chart like this, I just knew that this math has no future in my life. Now I'll balance my checkbook and I'll be, I'll be you know, responsible that way. That's what they should have taught me in high school. But, you know, there's certain things. I'm not going to develop that skill. It's not on who I am. And see, so here's the point that I want to make. Is that in life, in our career too, as we grow up, we can actually learn different skills, and they may not be grounded on our strength. And so what happens on the far right is that there's that person out there, let's say some pressures come or some challenges come uh, 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 on their life, but they are not grounded on their strength. That pressure, that weight can actually collapse someone. Uh, there's less joy in what they do. There's high stress. There's low productivity. They just don't seem very motivated to go to work, go to, go to their job or do what they're doing because something just doesn't sense right. And, and what it is is that you may actually not be doing what God intended you to do. You may not be living the life that God intended you to live. You may not be using your fundamental God-given strengths to, to shine, to soar. And so on the far left, you've got a guy who maybe has built his life on the right skills that accent the strengths that he's given. Then when pressure comes, that guy may feel the pressure or girl, but they will be able to have a flow and they're more engaged because they're doing what God has called them to do. This is a great teaching point for all of us. It was certainly a great teaching point for me because I, I certainly understand that I've got to change weaknesses in my life, but I also understand that some of my weaknesses will never be my strengths. Will never be my strengths. And I'd like to be able to build my life around my strengths because then I believe God will use me for that very purpose. Whatever strengths I may have, then, then God can use me to my greatest ability here on earth. And it's the same thing with you. My question is, what are your strengths? Do you know your strengths? The next slide here is, these are my personal strengths. I, I've taken uh, different assessments in life, uh, very popular assessments, Myers-Briggs assessment. Many of you have probably taken that. Another great strength finder is called Strength Finder. It's now Clifton Strengths, but these are my top five uh, strengths from this assessment and uh, out of 34 different character strengths these are the strengths that were identified for me and if you take something like this it's going to identify something different for you but if you know your strengths then you're going to be able to figure out with these strengths how to use your life how to live your life to its fullest because God gave you these strengths and I believe God wants you to actually build your life around your strengths. Because if you do, you're going to make a greater impact. You're going to be much more fulfilled in what you're doing in life. You're going to be much more, uh, more happy, more, more uh, just fulfilled. And so this is all part of walking with God. But... I want to encourage you to, uh, you know, take those tests or at least look into them. Or if you've taken them in the past, revisit what your strengths are and, and put that on your heart to figure out, okay, am I, am I in, you know, am I taking the right classes in school? Am I, am I pursuing a career that's, uh, you know, really going to magnify the strengths that I, I'm in? Am I, am I in the right current job? Am I not in the right current job? 
let's dream. Let's dream a little bit more of what God can do in our lives. Amen? Uh, I'm not going to go over what these strengths mean. Uh, in a nutshell, I function with value. I sense emotion. I like to be, be excellent as much as possible. I like to help things from where they are to become better. And there's a bigger picture in life. That, in a nutshell, and certainly God has shaped me over the decades. He certainly has. But find out what your strengths are, too. Find out. Because I believe if we all were in the same sweet spot with God and we were all pursuing how God has built us, we're going we're gonna to have more powerful little Jesuses walking around Oahu in a different way. Okay. All right. Enough of that. Um, the rest of my time, we're going we're gonna to talk about another aspect of walking with God that is very, very important has to do with your own personal Bible study. And so I've entitled this this time is how much is the Bible in you? Okay, so we're shifting gears here, guys. I want you to focus on your own private personal Bible study, what you do outside of church, what you do in your home or your coffee shop, in your car, at your office, in front of your desk, your own personal Bible studies. You know, if someone asked you what you learned in the Bible this week, could you give them a reply? Could you give them a truth? Could you share what you're doing in your times with God through your Bible study? Uh, now, I, I would expect you to expect me to be in my Bible, right? Yeah. This isn't a trick question. You're, you're probably assuming Anthony should be reading his Bible. And I do. And I'll share a little bit more, you know, about today. But I want to be able to expect from you that you're in your Bibles too. I want to be able to expect that from you. That I can say, yeah, every disciple in the Oahu Church of Christ is growing in their personal Bible study effectiveness. They're getting more out of their time with God. Because if you, if you spend time with God, you're going to be able to walk with God more powerfully, more effectively. So I've got some questions for you, okay? And here's where we're going. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help us understand some very common approaches of how we can study Bible. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you just a, a brief framework of what you could use if you, if you don't have anything, but if you have something, it's another tool, how you can be more effective. And then I'm going to have you practice with each other at the end, and then we'll take some communion. I want you to be able to identify where are you at. Here's some questions, guys. How, how would you describe your Bible study? You can write that down. You can take a mental note. But how would you describe it? You know, non-existent, bad, good, great, needs improvement. You come up with your own word. Another question is, what parts of the Bible have you not read or studied? Another question is, what's hindering you? deepening your study of God's word. And here's the last question for us, okay? What one thing will you do to improve your personal Bible study? I, I want us, by the time we leave, to make a decision to God, what one thing will you do? Okay? Because church is meant to empower us. It's meant to equip us to be faithful to the Lord, to spur us on toward love and good deeds. There's some passages here, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. You know, I see my prayer time is a time... You know, in prayer, that's when I talk to God. But in Bible study, that's when God talks to me. And I want to hear God's direction. I want to hear God's voice. The Bible will do that for you. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. 
These are classic verses that many of us remember and know. But these are passages that I had to look at this last week and say, I've got to remember these things. I've got to make sure that the Word of God is living in my life. It's active so that my quiet times aren't quiet. They're actually active. They're actually alive. They're actually making a difference in my life. I'm actually praying and communicating to God, but I'm also listening to Him. I'm paying attention to His direction. And all of us, we, we've done this in our lives. We say, oh, yeah, my dad taught me this. He My mom taught me this. I remember this friend taught me this principle and -and so-and-so. You remember how people have given you wisdom. I want to be able to remember when I'm in a situation, I remember what my Father in Heaven has told me. What He has told me, how I can make wiser decisions, how I can be more self-controlled, how I can just be more Christ-like. That's why it's important that the Word's got to be in me and it's got to be in you. It takes relationship. You know, I think the difference between reading the Bible and studying the Bible is often just a pen or pencil or journal. That's what I've found. The times that I don't reflect enough or don't write things down, uh, I don't get as much out of it. Then when I push myself to, to write things down, to journal. Now again, some of you will be motivated in different ways got to figure out what's going to help you improve in your knowledge and your application of God's word. But I think the difference between just Bible reading versus Bible study is a pen, a paper, a computer, a notebook, and to write things down. Uh, When I write things down, I push myself to reflect on God's word that much more. It It gives me the proper space to just meditate on this and listen to God's spirit and God's voice when I'm reading. Now, despite good intentions, and uh, all of us are busy in life, we've got a lot of things vying for our attention and our space and our energy. So you just take this wherever you're at and figure out one thing you can improve. But uh, here are four typical approaches that people take when they study the Bible. And you, you ask yourself, which one am I in? Okay, the fourth one is the best. The first three are not as good. The first, the first way to approach the Bible is you're a sitter. What does this mean? If you're a sitter, you don't do any personal Bible study. You don't read your Bible at all. Uh, you might come to church. You might get some things from church. But you're a sitter, which means you like to sit at the feet of someone who has studied the Bible. And you like to glean from their convictions and learn from their faith. And that, that, you know, that, that's who you are. Uh, you're just a sitter. But if you stay a sitter, you are, you're going to miss out in life when it comes to your own depth and value of experience in learning from God. And there's nothing wrong with learning from other people, but uh, the fact is uh, you're just not going to get a lot of depth and quality from your own walk with God. Uh, you've got to, you, you, you're, you're going to miss out. And uh, uh, you might diligently learn from others, but you've got to personally diligently learn to study your Bible yourself, okay? I mean, so are you a sitter? Is that where you're at? Well, then there's room for improvement. Okay, the second approach that people take, even in churches today, number two, you're a skimmer. You're a skimmer. Now, we we know good friends named Rob and Pat Skinner. They're not skimmers, they're skinners. Great people. They are certainly not skimmers when it comes to reading their Bible. But it's self-explanatory. If, if you're a person who's a skimmer, you're just, you just read the Bible superficially. You don't have a lot of time for Bible study. You know, it's, it's, it's a few verses here, a few verses there. It's when you can. It's when you have enough energy. It's when you, you know, you just skim over it. It's, uh, it's superficial. Now, they may be better off than the sitters because they're actually reading some verses and reading some Bible. But still, you see that the challenge is they're really not getting a whole lot out of it, uh, out of the Bible. Uh, Definitely, the Bible is meant to be studied. And skimmers need to be applauded, absolutely. But again, if, if you don't go beyond just passive learning from the Bible, then you're not gonna get a lot of personal excitement. So are you a skimmer? 
third area is the scholar. And uh, this group of people uh, enjoys you know, learning, feeling comfortable studying the Bible in a, in a, in a more academic or scholarly way. Uh, you could use uh, certainly different Bible translations, commentaries, dictionaries, reference tools, all those kinds of things. Personally, I use a Bible software called Word Search. I've used Logos in the past, but uh, Word Search has, has served me well for the last several decades. And it's, it's helped me because, uh, uh, you know, I've realized that uh, the, there's so many tools out there, Bible dictionaries, uh, original words, what they mean. Uh, there's, there's lots of tools available for all of us now that we don't have to know another language. We can, we can learn from other people and, and get that help. But uh, uh, he, here's the thing. People in the scholarly uh, position, uh, certainly there's an appetite to learn more, which is good. And I've, you know, I finished my own seminary degree. What I've learned is that just because I've gone through seminary doesn't mean I've changed. It doesn't mean I'm like more like Christ. And so uh, you got to be careful with that. Head knowledge is not life application. And uh, it's important because, you know, it's good to learn. It's absolutely good to learn and, and go deeper into the understanding of the Bible, but it still comes down to how much am I like Christ? How much am I changing to be like him? And uh, I, I've certainly been, I've been in all these categories, guys. I just want you to know, I've been a sitter, I've been a skimmer, I've been a scholar, I've been all these types of things. Uh, but are you a scholar, okay? Are you, you know, are you heavy on knowledge and learning? But make sure you, you are not detached from spiritual growth. You are not detached and you are personally applying things. The last area I want us to all strive for is you are a student. And, and these are the people I believe Paul describes in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. A Bible student... And we're, we're, we're challenged to be able to do this. In uh, Acts chapter 17, we're, we're in, implored to be uh, students of the word on a daily basis. But these are, these are people, individuals, men and women, who have a lifetime quest to learn God's word. There's always more to learn. But they're, 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 they're wanting to learn. Uh, the word of God is alive in their lives. You don't, you don't have to tell them to read their Bibles. They're motivated by themselves. They're, they're self-motivated to, you know, I need time with the Lord. I don't care how busy I am, I'm going to make time for God. I was with Corey Barton uh, yesterday, and I was inspired. He wakes up at like at 3 in the morning so he can study his Bible. He's a principal at, at Schaefer Elementary, uh, Shafter Elementary School now. But he, that, that's what he has to do. He has to wake up that early to read his Bible and, and get a little bit of exercise in before he has to go to work. And, and you may be like Corey. You may be doing that now that I'm not recognizing. Amen. Do whatever it takes to walk with God. Do whatever it takes to, for your life, for your station in life right now. Do whatever it takes to make sure you're a student of the Bible. You know, is God approved with your walk with him? Are you walking with confidence and correctly handling the word of truth? Again, it goes back to what I asked you originally. What one thing will you do to improve your personal Bible study with God? And so ask yourself, which, which one am I? Am I the sitter? Am I the skimmer? Am I the scholar? Or am I the student? You decide, and then you'll be able to make a decision on where you need to head. I want to encourage everyone to be students of God's Word. But that's something that only you can decide. That's something only you can be motivated to do and find, find that spiritual strength to do the right thing. Okay, I want to talk about, you may have different ways to motivate you, and I, I believe you do, okay? I'm going to give you five quick points of how you could study your Bible, even starting this week, if you use this method. It's, it's a basic method, a basic framework. It's called the inductive Bible study method, all right? So if you want to Go deeper in your Bible study and knowledge to be able to reflect. Number one, you got to look at a passage, look at a verse, look at a book, and, and ask, what's the background? What's the background? Here are some of the questions you might ask yourself to learn more. Okay, who wrote the book? 
Who wrote this passage? To whom was it written? What were the circumstances? Why was it written? What are the main themes? You could use commentaries. You could use Bible dictionaries. You could look up words. That's going to help you uh, dissect the verse and the book even more. Once you know the answers to these questions, you're going to be able to study the Bible. And it's going to become more alive. The characters will become more real for you. And that God's voice is listening and, 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 and speaking to you as well. The second thing that you could do is read goes without saying read the passage read the chapter read the book make sure you get away turn your phone off don't even have your phone get away from your computer get some quiet place some of the best places I've had quiet times is in cemeteries it's dead quiet it is it's really quiet no one's gonna bother me there but find a place that's going to be a place where you can dedicate yourself. I give myself to you. I give myself to you. You got to do it. You got to find a place. Read. Uh, highlight your Bible. Uh, some of you don't like to highlight books. You like to keep them in mint condition. That's there's no problem with that. Uh, you know, highlight your memory or whatever. Highlight uh, who was it? Uh, uh, Mitch. Mitchell Moore, he was in PKM earlier, and he, he shared, I, I like to actually print up the chapters of the Bible, and then I write on the notes, because I like my Bible without any writing on it. I said, hey, man, that's awesome. Whatever is going to help him learn the Bible. There's no one way to do it, guys. But, but, but read, be active. Don't be a skimmer. Thirdly, observe. Okay you got, you got to determine what this passage is saying or this verse. Look for the original intent of the person who wrote the book. Again, there are Greek and Hebrew uh, tools that you can uh, learn from. Uh, what was this word originally meant to say? Use different translations. Translations will maybe accentuate different ways of saying phrases or words. You know, ask yourself, what's the author saying to his audience? Write down the main points again. I think the difference between just reading versus study is a pen and paper and just forcing yourself to, to write things out and journal. Uh, number four, apply. How can you apply what you're learning to your daily life? Okay, And you can apply this to your work, your marriage, your family, your church, friends, how you handle money. You ask yourself, what does God want me to do as a result of this? Okay? You, you can ask yourself questions like, is, is there a promise to claim from God? Is there a command that I've got to obey? Is there sin for me to confess? Is there an example to follow? Behavior that I need to change? Encouragement to, re to receive? Reason to worship God? These are all good ways to be able to apply what you're learning from the Word of God. Lastly, memorize. Memorization is important in your personal Bible study. Because when you memorize scripture, and, you know, God forbid we know more secular songs than we do know scriptures. Uh, you know, we can recite a, a, you know, we can recite a, a song on the radio, but we're not so good with remembering where the passage was in the Bible. Uh, memorization is good. Because if you have God's word in your heart and in your mind, according to Psalm 119.11, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. You're going to be able to recall from God's wisdom and direction in your life. You'll make better decisions. You'll make better decisions in life. You're going to be able to make wiser decisions because you're hearing the voice of God. Okay? Here's an easy way to remember it. It's an acronym. It spells BROME. I don't even think there's a word in the English dictionary that's, okay, whatever. It's a, a B, Rome, or bro, am. You, you, can, you, can, you can remember it any way you want. But just a simple framework. Brome. What are you doing today, bro? I'm broming. What are you doing, sis? Bro, bro, am. 
All right. Okay. I'm going to end our time. I want you guys to practice here a minute. Okay. I want you to put your Bible study hats on. Let's get some practical, practical things here. Okay. So we're going to take, we're going to take maybe the next five minutes. You just talk to the, the, the person next to you, you know, groups of two, groups of three. And I want you to practice this because this is part of worship. This is part of learning. And it's good to exercise these kinds of muscles to imprint it on you. All right, here's a passage I want to give you right here. James chapter 1, verse 2 through 4. So you're going to have to get your Bible out, your tablet, or whatever you use. And this is what I want you guys to talk about in the next five minutes amongst each other. Let's just take our time within five minutes. And we're not going to do all five steps. We don't have time to do five steps. We'll just do two of the steps. And one step is just the observation part of it, okay? What does this say? What does this say? And, uh, and then lastly, what should I do? Okay? So I'm going to sit down for about five minutes, and I'm going to let you guys read and talk. And then I'll come back up and we'll just close out. Okay? Sound good, guys? So let's enjoy it. Let's put our Bible study hats on and hearts. And let's go for it. Okay, let's go ahead and bring it back. Sorry to interrupt you during the midstream. I know you just got things going. All right, awesome. We're just a talkative group, aren't we? 
So uh, again, this was just a short practice. And if it's new for you and you can use it, then great. If you've got something else that, that gets you going with your Bible study, then great. And I just encourage you to keep doing it and be effective. Uh, Son was mentioning uh, to me, she goes, uh, God, I think I'm mature enough. I don't need more maturing. I don't need more, uh, I don't need more trials. I don't need more suffering to be more mature. Aren't I mature enough, God? So uh, here, here's some possible things. I obviously had more time to think about this. So here, here's some things I just wanted to show you, okay? Observations of what this could say. You know, be joyful when trials come. Uh, they can be useful for producing greater good in my life. I know that when my faith is tested, I'm going to grow in endurance. Trials are good. God's hands aren't tied when I go through hard times. He's able to work even in my hardship. Growing is more important than comfort. I can handle life with God's help. I mean, the only way for me to become mature is that I've got to go through trials. That's the only path. That's the path of Jesus Christ. So if I seek comfort too much, I'm missing out. I'm missing out and growing to be more and more like Christ. Application, you know, what should I do? Think of a trial I'm going through or one in the past and show joy by thanking God right now that he is or was working in my life. You know, it changes my whole attitude when I think of trials. Whether I'm going through one now or something in the past, I need to thank God for that because God has a lesson, God has a plan through it. I could call or write a note to someone who is going through a trial. That's a good application with this too. I could encourage them, let them know that I'm praying for them. That could be a good application of you see how that works, guys? Bottom line, as we close here, wisdom from God is available to those who are lifetime students of the Bible. If you dedicate yourself to be a student of the Bible, then you are going to learn wisdom from God. You're going to learn more and more from him. So I go back to that question again that I had in the very beginning, guys, is what one thing will you change to improve personal Bible study. Here's my prayer in my notes that I wrote. God, this is super convicting. I need to consistently sit down and study the Bible like it's a good meal. It can be more like fast food and feeding off the insights of other people. Please forgive me, God, as I see the greater need to hear your voice personally in my life. I'm grateful to have learned from others and will continue to do so, but I repent of my personal distance from you emotionally and consequently spiritually. Please forgive me, accept my repentance, and as I strive to be the student of the Bible, may your blessings be felt and seen even more throughout my life. That's a prayer. I want to encourage you today, this week, talk to other people about how they're broming. Share with others how you're broming. Share what God is sharing with you. And God will work in all of our lives. Let's pray share communion. God, thank you so much for our time to learn about you and to walk closer to Jesus Christ. We are thankful for your precious word, for the sacrifice, the body, and the blood that was shed for us to have this relationship with you and the honor and privilege to walk with you. In Christ's name, amen.
encourage my soul and let us journey on for the night is dark and I am far from home thanks be to God the morning light appears encourage my soul and let us journey on for the night is dark and I am far from home thanks be to God the morning light appears the storm is passing over the storm is passing over the storm is passing over hallelujah the storm is passing over the storm is passing over, the storm is passing over, hallelujah, 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 oh, the storm. The storm is passing over, the storm is passing over, hallelujah, 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 the storm. The storm is passing over, the storm is passing over, hallelujah. How's it everybody? Haven't always been a bromer, got to confess. You know, brome. I haven't always been a bromer. Is that not funny? Okay. But I've always been a brada, you know, and the fact that I've read through the scriptures is a, just a testament to God's grace. Because to be honest, you know, before reading the Bible, I never really read too much books. So the fact that God led me through a thousand-page book is is really... It's a miracle in my in my pages, you know what I mean? So, and I know I'm not the only brother in here. <clears throat> but nah, I've been I've been reading the scriptures for about 8 years now and it's absolutely changed my life and I appreciate lessons like these because I think it's really a reflection of like how God wants us to really handle and treat his word. Like I think he wants us to to treat it with a reverence and a gentleness when we teach one another and I think it's a reflection of our church as well too like how we love to sit down and study the Bible with people if if someone didn't ask me eight years ago hey can I study the Bible with you I probably would have never picked up the Bible on my own so there, there might be some people in here like that today that are wondering how can I get deeper into this because that's a lot of points today and it might be a little overwhelming for you and I can relate to you but if you're interested and it's on your heart Ask the person next to you, hey, can I study the Bible with you? Can I get into the scriptures? Can I learn more about God through his word? And trust me, you're not going to regret it. It's going to change your life. The scripture is going to change your life. But thank you for such a practical lesson today, Anthony. We appreciate your efforts. Thank you. Okay, we get a couple announcements. Jordan, where you stay? How's it, my brother? <laughs> How's it going, singles? This is an announcement for the island getaway. Um, thanks, bro. Um, so we want to be able to 
have a head count by April 15th. April 15th, and many of you guys know that's tax day. So pretty memorable for us, okay? Um, and so by that date, we want to have a $100 deposit so that we can start booking lodging, transportation, and all things like that, okay? Sound good? April 15th, reservation, okay? $100 deposit, please remember that. Um, the estimation of the price would be about $500 to $700 for the Singles Island Getaway. Okay, all singles are welcome. If you have kids, come through, okay? If you G-Squad, you're more than welcome to come through. Okay, all singles are welcome. It's going to be a great opportunity to fellowship and forge deeper relationships with each other. Amen. Where are you guys going? Kauai. Bring me back some Hanalei Poi, bro. Uh, next week, next uh, in month of April, we're going to be here for UH. Uh, same services for your Keiki through the doors, just back over there and then downstairs. Again, all the month of April, we're at UH. And then lastly, we have a men's Devo night. This is on, this is on March 30th in the Art Auditorium at 5 o'clock p.m. So we're going to get together as men to be able to bond and have fellowship uh, over a movie and then discussion to just be closer as a men's ministry in the Wild Church of Christ. Amen. Have a great Sunday. We have one more song. Love you guys. Hey Amen. Let's go ahead and stand on up. Go ahead and clap your hands. I hope you're inspired by the Word of God to make the adjustments necessary in your life to get closer to Him. I hope that we walk away making decisions to be better for Him because that's what He deserves in our life. Isn't that true? And so as we sing, I want you to remember that it's his love that gives us the ability to praise him and worship him. Your love is amazing, steady and unchanging. Your love is a mountain firm beneath my feet. Your love is a mystery, how you gently lift me. When I am surrounded, your love carries me. Sing hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Your love makes me sing hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Your love makes me sing. Your love is a surprise. Your love is surprising, I can feel it rising, all the joy that's growing deep inside of me. And every time I see you, all your goodness shines through, and I feel this God song rising up in me. Sing hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Makes me sing hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Your love makes me sing. Your love is amazing, steady and unchanging. Your love is a mountain firm beneath my feet. Your love is a mystery, how you gently live me. When I am surrounded, your love carries me. Singing hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Your love makes me sing. Sing hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. You'll sing that again. Sing hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, your love makes
makes me sing, sing hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Sing it out to God. Your love makes me sing, sing hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. All right, church, you are dismissed. Have a wonderful Sunday.